Richard Widmark. This is Eleanor Parker. And this is Hugh Douglas saying, welcome to Hollywood Soundstage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And just a word about our play tonight. James M. Kane is deservedly one of the great novelists of our time. Many of his stories have been translated into effective and sometimes disturbing motion pictures. But none we think with greater realism, with more savage power and brooding tenderness than the story we're going to do tonight. Hollywood Soundstage is proud to bring you transcribed Metro-Golden-Mayer's magnificent picture, The Postman Always Rings Twice, starring Eleanor Parker, Richard Widmark, and the Screen Guild Players. Twin Oaks Tavern, the place was called. You know the kind of joint I mean. You can see one on any road in America. An old wooden house that's been remodeled. Lunchroom added on in front and a gasoline pump out in the yard. A sign was hanging on the pump, man wanted. So I opened the door and walked in. Yes? She was standing near the counter, dressed all in white. White and cool on that hot summer afternoon. And looking at me like I was dirt. Well? She didn't fool me, though, not even then. She was dynamite in a cake of ice. I knew it. And she knew I knew it. And when she found she couldn't stare me down. Something you want? Not a thing. I just work here. Since when? Since you asked. Well, the best way not to be working here is to try and be funny. Just remember that, Mr. Smart Guy. the boss's wife. Her name was Cora, Cora Smith. And every chance she got, she showed me she didn't like me. A lot. I knew I had to take it slow and easy, so I just stuck to my job, tried to get in solid with the boss. That part was a cinch. The poor guy had had so much trouble with help. By the end of a week, we were just like pals. Uh, go ahead, Frank. Have some wine. Ooh, we got to celebrate tonight. You're the boss, Nick. Hey, Cora, some wine for you? No, thanks. <laughs> You're the one should be celebrating. You've been wanting that neon sign for two years. Hey, Frank, you ever see a finer sign than that? I never have. Honest, the way she kept begging for that sign... Uh, Nick, think Nick, it... why don't you play something on the guitar? Yeah, why don't you, Nick? Sure. Hey, maybe Cora will do a little dance for us. She's a wonderful dancer. No, I always feel silly dancing alone. Put on a record, Nick. I'll dance with you. Well, I'll put on a record, but no dancing. Not me. I keep telling her, Frank, I'm like a lot of smart men. My brains are not in my feet. <laughs> uh, how about me dancing with Mrs. Smith? No, thanks. I don't think I... Why not? Go ahead, Cora. I like to watch dancing. That was the first time I ever had my arms around her, right under Nick's nose. I didn't say a thing, neither did she. But I guess we both knew. Then all of a sudden, she pulled away. <sighs> That's enough, Nick. Turn it off. But Cora, you dance so nice together. It's too hot to dance. I... I think I'll drive down to the beach for a swim. Well, that's a good idea. You haven't been out of this place for a month. I'll go get my things. I won't be long. Say, uh, Nick, why don't we all go for a swim? Oh, I don't swim very well, and the undertow is pretty strong. Yeah? Well, uh, mind if I ride down in the car with her? Not if she doesn't. Thanks, Nick. Say, if that undertow is so strong, I'm going to stay close to shore. I don't know why you had to come along. You haven't even been near the water. I know. I promised Nick. Promised him what? That I'd stay close to shore. Hey, tell me something. How did you ever come to marry him? That's none of your business. No need to get sore. You uh, come from this part of California? No. Nope. Where then? Don't laugh. Iowa. Why the don't laugh? <laughs> the tired old joke. Everybody in Southern California is supposed to come from Iowa. Did you come here with Nick? No. I only met Nick four years ago. And the next question you asked before. Maybe I knew the answer when I asked. 
Oh, sure, you got it all figured out. A smart little Jenny marries herself into a nice, steady business. Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Smarty Pants. When I married Nick, he only had a couple of hundred dollars. Starting the Twin Oaks was my idea, and if it's making nice money, now it's as much me as Nick. Well, now, I only ask... Well, the rest of it is still none of your business. Okay, it's your life. Just sounds a little dull to me. (laughs) To you, it would. And what Nick tells me about your ideas. And what's wrong with my ideas to have my fun now, not when I'm old and rich and retired. Rich and retired. I think you'll end up a retired tramp. I don't think you think that at all. (laughs) Come on, let's go back. I wouldn't want Nick getting any ideas. Nick hasn't any reason to get ideas. I know he hasn't. Yet. I... I think we'd better be getting on home. Wait a minute. Stop. Stop. I... All right, I've kissed you. Nick's got his reason. Now what? Nothing. We... We'd better get back to the car. Everything was fine that night. But the next morning, she wouldn't even talk to me. And I had a feeling it wasn't just because she was mad. So I waited till Nick had started for town, and I walked into the kitchen. Cora. Get out of here. Are you crazy? Where's Nick? He just had a brainstorm. Drove into L.A. He thinks the laundry service is cheating him. Oh, Cora, honey. No, no. Wait, Frank, please. I, I want to tell you something. What? Frank, about that question. What question? Why I married Nick. My answer is that Nick came along at the right time with a wedding ring. A wedding ring was the first thing he mentioned. And you liked that. You'd always had to fight off a lot of guys. A lot of guys? All the guys. I don't especially like the way I look sometimes, but I never met a man since I was 14 who didn't want to give me an argument about it. So by the time Nick came along, you were ready to marry anybody who owned a gold watch. I I told him I didn't love him. I told him. And you said that had come in time, but it didn't. Honest, I, I meant to stick by him, but I... Cora. What's that? Sounds like somebody trying to get in. Is the lunchroom door locked? Yeah. I must have locked it. Frank. Frank, they... They've gone away. What time is it? Is it getting late? Almost six. Nick ought to be back in half an hour. Frank, we're not going on like this, are we? No. I've been thinking about us going away. That's what I've been thinking about, too, almost ever since I saw you. Frank, I'll leave a note for Nick. Where'll we go? How do I know? Depends on which way we can thumb a ride. There goes another one whizzing by. Now don't worry, Cora. We'll get a lift. When? I, I don't know which is more tired, my thumb or my arches. Well, wait a minute. Let's take time <sighs> out. Huh? Here, sit down in the bag. Yeah. Now, let's have it, Cora. What's on your mind? Frank, if I divorce Nicky, he'll never give me a nickel. He'll keep the Twin Oaks and everything. What do we care? Well, maybe it doesn't mean anything to you, but I want to be somebody. And the Twin Oaks is mine. If I walk out like this, I'll lose all I put in it, and I'll never be anybody. Oh, I love you, Frank. I, I want you, but oh, not this way. Not starting off like a couple of tramps. I'm going back. Okay, you're the boss. Please understand it only because I love you. And Oh, Frank. What's the matter now? The note I left for Nick. If he gets home before... Where'd you leave it? In the cash register. God, it's the first place he'll look. Come on and just forget about those arches. Oh, it's okay. The note's still here. We made it. Uh, Not by much. Isn't that Nick's car coming up the road? Hey, I-, I better put that bag away. Hey, wait a minute. Why is he driving like that from side to side? Oh, well, we must have been celebrating again. He's drunk. He's either drunk or he's crazy. L- look out, that no! truck! Oh, brother, that was close. Yeah. We should get that plastered some night and drive off a cliff. Hey, you don't mean that. You were joking. What? Oh, sure. Sure, I, I... I was just joking. 
Of course you were joking. Of course. I couldn't get to sleep that night. Maybe I was afraid to sleep. Maybe I was afraid I'd dream. So I went outside. I lit a cigarette and walked around. Then I noticed a light was on in Nick and Cora's room. And then almost without knowing it, I was standing near their window. That's how I happened to hear what I did. But, Cora, that's something to celebrate, isn't it? If I sell the Twin Oaks at a big profit? That's what I don't understand. We're making good money. Why sell out now? Well, for one thing, so you can take it easy. We're going back to Michigan to live with my sister. Sister? You never told me you had a sister. I... I didn't want to worry you. You see, she hasn't been well for the last few years. Sort of paralyzed. She needs us to take care of her. You mean she needs me? She needs a free nurse. Oh, now, Cora, please. I won't uh... do it, Nick. And I won't let you sell. Half of this place ought to be mine. More than half of it. All of it. And I'll stop you somehow. I don't think so, Cora. Remember when we got married? That little paper you signed? That just gave you the right to rent this place. That's what I let you think. That paper was what they call a marriage settlement. Nick! Nick, you didn't do that to me. Why, you thief, you... You cheat, you lie! After all, I'd only known you a couple of weeks. I had to protect that house back in Michigan. But since you don't care about my sister, that paper can cover the Twin Oaks, too. Oh, Nick! 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 Cora, it's me. Frank? Yeah. What are you doing out here? Well, I, I couldn't sleep. I was just walking around. Cora, I, I, I was outside your window a little while ago. I heard what Nick said. Well, I won't let him do it. I won't let him do it. I don't know how you can stop him, Cora. Oh, Frank. Frank, do you love me? Yeah. Do you love me so much that nothing else matters? Yeah, I do. Well, then there's... One thing we could do that would fix up everything. <laughs> what? Pray for something to happen to Nick? Something like that. Cora. You suggested it yourself this afternoon. Oh, yeah, yeah, but I, I, I was only joking. Were you? Yes. yes or had you started to think about it? Oh, now, now, wait a minute, Cora. Listen I, I to can't me, do... Frank. I'm not what you think I am. I, I just want to keep this place and work hard and be something, that's all. Oh, I've made a big mistake in my life, and I, I've got to be this way just once to fix Cora, it. Cora, they hang you for that. Not if you do it right. And you're smart, Frank. You'll think of a way. But he, he never did anything to me. Sure he did. Maybe he didn't know it, but he did it to you and me, to both of us. Oh, don't you see, Frank? Us? That's all that matters. You, you really love me that much? That much. Oh, I'm no good, Frank. I'm no good. But I love you. It's in the cards. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's in the cards. We didn't know how we were going to do it. We didn't have any plan. It was Nick himself who gave it to us. The next morning, he was feeling real good. Cora had made up with him. He was bubbling over with ideas. Uh, this fellow who's buying the place, he wants me to meet him tomorrow morning in Santa Barbara. We can all drive up tonight and have a little celebration. Well, what do you mean we can all drive up? Where do I come in? Oh, I, I want you to meet him, Frank. You see, I, I told him you'd manage the Twin Oaks for him. Yeah, I, I gave you a pretty good recommendation. Thanks. Well, he doesn't get the place until tomorrow. Anything we take in today is still ours. Come on, let's get out there and get to work. <laughs> That's how she was all afternoon. Quiet, cold, and deliberate. Until we had the plan all set and got ready to leave. Part of my job was to get Nick drunk. But I didn't have to try very hard. He started celebrating around 4 o'clock. By 7.30 it was getting dark, so we locked up the place and started off. Car at the wheel. Nick and me and a bottle of wine in the back seat. <laughs> Come on, Frank. Let's have a little harmony, huh? Sure, sure. Go ahead, Nick. There's a long, long trail of winding into... Hey, Cora, you're making the wrong turn. No, I'm not. The stakes is right by Malibu Lake. I've always wanted to see it, Nick. 
<laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> There's a long, long trail of winding into the land of mountains. And that's how we were when we reached the top of Malibu Pass, where the roads cut right from the side of the mountain. Nick was just having another drink when Cora stopped the car at the edge of the cliff. Hey, you, you, what you stopping for, Cora? We, we got a long way to go. The engine's overheated. I better let it cool off. <laughs> Say, that, that's right. You got to save this little bus to take to Michigan. Hey, uh, Nick, how about another song? You were going pretty good. Oh, sure. sure. Just hold this bottle, Frank. I'll, I'll start us off. Okay. Hey, pack up your troubles in your old kid bag and smile. <laughs> Get out of the car, quick. Stand back, I'll have to jump. I left it in high. Good. We can roll it right off. Frank, jump! Frank. Frank, we did it. Yeah. It'll be tough going from here. Sure you can go through with it? After seeing that, I can go through with anything. Okay. You, you, you'll have to muss up your dress, rip a couple of tears in it. Yeah. Now I'll get down there, climb in the car, rough myself up. Now, when you're sure I'm inside, you can head down the road and start yelling for help. Yeah. You positive you can take it, Cora? Yes. There's just one thing now. Us. Nothing else matters. The car had stopped halfway down the cliff, hung up on a little ledge. I scrambled to it, climbed in the back, pulled the door closed. Cora started yelling up on the road. Then all of a sudden, the car slid forward. It began to gain speed, turned over twice, and then something hit me and everything went black. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. First, the doctor was there. Then the district attorney, a fellow named Sackett. He asked a lot of questions, wrote down everything I said. Then he opened the door and called to Cora. All right, Mrs. Smith, you can see him now. Thank you. Hello, Frank. How are you? Shaken up a little, Mrs. Smith. Your arm? The doctor says it's not broken. How are you? I missed getting hurt by a miracle. That was a crazy stunt your husband pulled, Mrs. Smith, reaching from the back and trying to grab the wheel. Poor Nick, he was so drunk. Well, I might as well get this report turned in. Chambers, you told the doctor you were driving. I was. Mrs. Smith told me she was at the wheel. I was. How about that, Chambers? Well, well, I, I, I don't know. It, it uh, seems to me that I, I was driving, but well, I, I guess I couldn't be sure. I, I mean, I, I guess I'd been drinking a little bit too. Yeah. Saw the chemist report on your blood. You keep drinking like that for a few more years, and your blood's going to be 90 proof. I'm swearing off this stuff right now. Pretty good idea. You wouldn't want another accident like this. Next time, you might not get off so lucky. They all took it like that, swallowed our story from start to finish. They brought me a lot of papers to sign, then they checked me out of the hospital. And then Cora and I took the bus for home. All the way out, she never said one word. Just kept staring out the window. But once we were back at the Twin Oaks again, and the door was locked, and we knew we were safe. Frank? Yes, Cora? Frank, are you sorry? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not sorry exactly. I just sort of feel as though... Cora, let's, let, let's clear out of here. Let's go somewhere else, anywhere. And give up this place? Yes. After what I've been through to keep it, not on your life. What's the matter, Frank? Getting scared. Maybe I am. Maybe I am getting scared. Almost any minute, I, I expect to hear that guitar again or, or hear him singing the way, the way he was singing. You're just I... using that for an excuse. You want to go away because you still think it's fun to be a, a tramp. Now, Cora, please, You've been don't trying to make a tramp out of me ever since you've known me, but you're not going to do it. I'm staying here. All right, I'll do whatever you say. And you know why. What do you mean, I know? Are you trying to say that you're afraid of me? Afraid I might try to double-cross you, go back to Sackett and try to pin the whole thing on you? Cora, and look, so don't... that's the truth of it. If you stay here, it's only because you're afraid to leave. That's not true. 
but, but maybe that's why you won't let me go. You're afraid that maybe I might squeal. Maybe I am. All right, then. All right, then, we're hooked. I guess maybe we are. But I won't feel so bad after we're married. Married? There happens to be a law in this country, Frank. A husband and wife can't testify against each other. I think maybe we'll both feel safer that way. She didn't want to get married right away. She was afraid it might start people talking. So the next few weeks were pretty brutal. Her watching me, me watching her. Each other scared of what the other might do. There were times when I thought I couldn't stand it any longer. And then one evening she came to me. I think we'll get married tonight, Frank. Some little town down near the border. You bring out the car. Frank. Yes, Cora. Frank, before we're married, I want to know something. And tell me the truth, because I'm going to tell the truth to you. What do you want to know? During these weeks, sometime, you, you must have planned to run away. Why didn't you? Why didn't I? <laughs> because we're chained to each other, Cora. Ever since that night on the mountain. We were on top of a mountain, but it's been on top of us ever since that night. Is that the only reason you didn't go away? No. It was because of you and me. Don't say you love me now. Well, the funny part is, I do. No, that's not love, Frank. When fear comes into it, it isn't love anymore. It's hate. Do you hate me? I don't know. And I've got to know. I've got to know the truth. Frank, Frank, will you do something for me? Then I'll know. How? Take me, take me over to the beach, swimming. That place we went the first time you kissed me. Oh, that's me. a funny thing No, to please, do. please, Frank, don't ask any questions. Just take me down to the beach, and I, I promise you everything will be settled one way or another before we come back. All right, if it means so much to you. You take the next road to the right. <laughs> Cora, don't you think we're out far enough? There's a riptide tonight. Yes, yes, I, I think this ought to be far enough. You tired? Very tired. How about you? I'm still all right. Uh, I, I swim better than you, but, but you're stronger. Uh, Frank, Frank, uh, this is what I meant in the car. What? If, if you don't trust me completely, if, if you don't believe, I'd never turn on you. Cora. If, if you don't want me to go back with you, you don't have to. You can swim back by yourself. I'm, I'm too tired to make it. Nobody will ever know. Cora, I... I wouldn't want to live without you. And don't don't you say another word, honey. Just save your breath. I'll, I'll take you in. Cora, are you sure now? I'm sure. I'm sure I love you. I'm sure we're going to be happy. Almost as happy as, as if all this had happened to us before, Nick. Uh, we weren't that lucky, Cora. But, but we'll, we'll start out now. A, a brand new life. A brand new life. Let's kiss on that, huh? <laughs> Not while you're driving. When we get home, Frank. Then there'll be kisses. Kisses with dreams in them. Kisses that come from life, not death. Just, just one little one now. <laughs> All right. One teeny little... Frank! Frank, the bridge! <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury, I tell you, this man is a mad dog. A mad dog that must be put out of the way to protect the homes and lives of our community. Cora Smith's letter, which we found in her room, proves without question that Frank Chambers helped her to kill her husband so that between them they could share his estate. But, tortured by fear, the fear that she might someday break and confess their crime, he then conceived this fiendish plan to kill her too. The evidence is complete and overwhelming. There is only one verdict that you can bring in. Guilty. Guilty of murder in the first degree. 
let them talk. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they do to me now. If I could only be sure that Cora knows. That she understands how it happened. If I could only be sure that somewhere, somehow, I'll, I'll have a chance to tell her and make her believe that I never really wanted anything in the world but her. <laughs> it's funny how it all works out. It's just like when you're expecting a letter. You hang around the front door, afraid you might not hear the postman ring. You forget that the postman always rings twice. Yeah, he rang twice for Cora. And now he's ringing twice for me. Just heard the Hollywood soundstage production of Metro Golden Mayer's great dramatic hit, The Postman Always Rings Twice. And now, here are the stars of our play tonight Eleanor Parker and Richard Widmark. It's always a great privilege to appear here because this is our show. This radio program supports the greatest cause in our industry, the Motion Picture Relief Fund. And every actor in Hollywood is proud to share in that. Isn't that right, Eleanor? Absolutely, Dick. But why limit it to actors? Producers, writers, directors, they're all combining to make this half hour one of the highlights of the radio week. For example, next week's show, which Hugh Douglas will tell you about in a moment. In a moment, as soon as we scram away from this mic. <laughs> That's right. Good night, everybody, and thanks. Thanks again. Good night. Next week, Hollywood Soundstage will bring you one of the greatest stories to come out of the last war, 20th Century Fox Studios' dramatic document, 13 Rue Madeleine. It will star Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., Don DeFore, Henry O'Neill, and Craig Stevens. Be sure to listen. The Postman Always Rings Twice was presented by arrangement with Metro-Golden-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture Pandora and the Flying Dutchman, starring James Mason and Eva Gardner. Eleanor Parker will next be seen with Stuart Granger, Janet Lee, and Mel Ferrer in the Metro-Golden-Mayer Technicolor production, Scaramouche. Tonight's appearance of Richard Widmark was made possible by permission of 20th Century Fox Studios, and he can currently be seen in the Technicolor production, Red Skies of Montana. Also appearing in tonight's cast were Frank Nelson and Lou Merrill. Hollywood Soundstage was transcribed in the film Capital. Our play was adapted and directed by Harry Conman. Friday night is music night on CBS Radio. Music by Ray Block, Alfredo Antonini, and Paul Weston. And of course, there's fun in Robert Q's Waxworks, too. It adds up to great musical listening every Friday on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>